Now, lunch is approaching. Uh, last presentation before lunch. So, I'm not so sure if after my presentation you are more hungry than you are now because I will show you some nice pictures of food or if after my presentation you don't want to eat anymore because I will show you what can be done to increase the shelf life of food. We will see. I hope it's the former, but we will see. Before we start, let's introduce a little bit uh, our company. Our company, Albis Plastic, is, uh, is built basically on three pillars. We do classical uh, polymer distribution, we do compounding, and we do technical service. Uh, in the distribution business, especially in the Turkish market, uh, important partners for us are Lion Del Basel, are companies like Styrolution, are Samsung, and are Bayer Material Science, um, where we sell their polymers. Compounding for us mainly means engineering resins. We do a lot of compounding in polyamide, in polycarbonate, in PCABS. Technical advice is for us the closure around all this speech. We are helping all customers on a, you can say, 360 degree angle. So we would do mold flow analysis. We would help in design. We would help in regulatory issues. So this is our perspective of a 330 degree service for our customers. Now, we are a global company. We have uh, worldwide si uh, 17 subsidiaries. Um, what we do is we have a strong regional support, having salespeople, but always having also regional technical service people. And we have the central expertise in our headquarters in Hamburg, Germany, where we have central R&D, central laboratories to, to do all the R&D work. Facts and figures at a glance. Um, we are founded, were founded 1961. Um, 985 close to 1,000 employees, 17 subsidiaries, I mentioned that. We have four compounding sites, um, two of them in Germany, one in England, and one recently opened in China. Um, this is what we produce ourselves with our own uh, compounding lines. But for the US market, for example, and the Indian market, we also work with licensed toll producers that would produce our formulations for the local markets. Now, into the active packaging. You have seen this definition before. Um, I mean, in Europe, we absorb more and more applications where the packaging is not only there to protect the food, but it's also there to increase the shelf life or maintain or improve the quality of the food inside. So the European, European Union did what they are really good at. They did a regulation out of that. So the heart of this active packaging regulation says that active packaging means adding an additive to the packaging. And this additive modifies the composition of either the food or of the headspace that is around the food. That is the regulation. So it's important to note that EVOH barrier materials, for example, or UV absorbers that, that block the UV light from reaching the, the food, they are not active packaging materials according to this definition. Now, how can active packaging be done? Um, the focus of my speech will be oxygen scavenging, so you can reduce oxygen out of a headspace of a, of a food packaging, but you can do other things. You can do humidity control, so adjust a certain target level of humidity inside the packaging so that your product is not too dry but also not too humid. You can control gases, you can control carbon dioxide, so you can absorb it, but you could also absorb ethane, for example, if we are talking about fruits and vegetables. And then you have the microwave suspectors, so susceptors, so products that transform the microwave radiation into infrared radiation in order to make crispy and brownish products. Then you have the self-venting films, so if you heat up a packaging that it does not expand and explode, but releases the pressures that um, arrive during heating. And you have, we have heard about this today already, antimicrobial packaging. So protect the plastic surface of a packaging and or protect the food itself for microbial, for microbial growth. This is especially important um, with these new trends that we find for fresh cut salads, fresh cut vegetables um, and these kind of applications. And 
what is the driver behind this active packaging? Why are we doing all these things? What is the motivation? So one thing is, especially in, in Western Europe, people simply throw away food if the best before date is over. Although they wouldn't necessarily have to do that, but they are minded like that. The best before date is over, we throw it away. Um, we heard the figure before of uh, 90 billion euros of waste food in the European Union. It's a high number. For me, even more impressive is the number of the tonnage behind that. So in Europe are produced 620 million tons of food and 245 million tons of this food is wasted. So this is the trend behind all that, behind trying to improve, increase the shelf life of food. Now, how big is the market for active packaging? Here are some figures out of a study um, from 2009. Um, summarized, we can say worldwide, we have um, more than 3 billion US dollar um, market share of active packaging worldwide. And as you can see here, one third of that is actually oxygen scavenging, followed by moisture scavenging and microwave susceptors. Now, oxygen scavenging, this one billion 1 billion US dollars is not just one technology. There are different technologies behind how we can reach or how we can do oxygen scavenging. So what we can do are basically three main technologies. We can catch the oxygen by the oxidation of iron. Iron turns into rust, oxidizes, so absorbs oxygen. This can be done or is done these days commercially in two ways. One way is to add the iron through a packaging film in, in the thickness of this film. The oxygen migrates to the uh, iron and the absorption takes place. Another way to do that is to use sachets, these small little bags filled with iron powder and you add this to the packaging unit. This is something we find mainly in Asia. In Europe, um, food producers are a little bit reluctant because they have the fear that Customers, us, consumers, they find this small little sachet, this small little bag, and they think it's salt and pepper or spices, and they open and put on top of the food. So, okay, these people seem to think us consumers are not so intelligent, but in Europe, the trend is really not to use these sachets. It's more an Asian thing. What is true for both of those technologies is that both of these systems are activated to start the oxygen absorption by humidity. Then we have oxidation, oxida oxidation of polymers. So you can use polymers that carry a lot of double bonds, so that are highly unsaturated. And these double bonds can open and in this way absorb oxygen. Um, this mechanism is mainly activated by uh, UV or peroxides. And then you have the scavenging of uh, sodium sulfide. Sodium sulfide is highly hygroscopic and would transform upon uptake of oxygen. Um, this is used very often in screw caps, in crown corks, um, in the bottles industry. Now, what is important in this context is all these technologies are oxygen scavenging. They take away oxygen out of the food packaging. They are not barrier techniques. We will see later on um, also a scientific explanation to that. Some market figures again coming out of um, the same study. So you can see this 1.1 billion uh, US dollars market share worldwide of active packaging or oxygen scavenging in this case is uh, dominated rather by drinks. So you have beer, other drinks, ready to drink, drink beverages. So these segments really consume most of the oxygen scavenging uh, materials sold. But we also see that ready meals, bakery products, and fresh and processed meat are really catching up and still show some significant growth rates for the future. Now, oxygen scavenging with Shelf Plus. Shelf Plus is a product sold by Albis, as you can imagine, and this is basically an iron-containing master batch. It's an iron in a master batch form that works as an, as an oxygen scavenger. You can see here, what? you can see here a typical structure that would apply the oxygen scavenger. So you have here the food, you have a sealing layer, then you have a polymer layer with a chef plus, tie layer, EVOH barrier, tie layer, 
again the shelf plus and the outside layer. So it's typically to find this kind of products in multi-layer structures. The product is food compliant according to European law and to FDA law. And I also would like to mention that um, according to this active packaging regulations we heard about a lot already today, um, this is a regulation that will work with a positive list. So if you want to sell a product or use a product for active packaging, you need to use raw materials that are on this positive list. Now this positive list is not yet published by the European Union, but for Chef Plus all the data are already submitted and we have a, a letter of scientific opinion that indicates that upon publishing of this um, listed additives that can be used for active packaging, Chef Plus products shall be included because all the tests are, are done properly. So with such a structure, with such a product, product we can do active packaging. Now, how does this work in a little bit more detail? Um, on the left-hand side of this slide, you can see what, what will happen if you apply a passive barrier packaging. You have the packaging in the packaging thickness. You have the barrier material, for example, EVOH. And you have inside your packaging a certain concentration of oxygen. In the headspace, this can be a high value or a low value, depending if you do MAP packaging or not. And you can also have oxygen inside the food itself. Now what the passive barrier is doing, it simply blocks any oxygen um, from going from the outside to the inside. Now if you combine a barrier technology with an active scavenging technology, you have a slightly different picture. You still have your, your food packaging. The barrier blocks the oxygen from arriving inside the headspace of the packaging, but now the scavenging effect would take oxygen through the thickness of the packaging film and absorb it here internally. So after a certain period of time, and we will later on see how big this period of time is, you reduce the number of oxygen or the amount of oxygen compared to passive uh, packaging. Now that was the principle. Um, now we can also see that in, in real life. And being a German, of course, the picture must be sauerkraut and mashed potatoes, I have to say. So what you can see here is um, EVOH barrier trays filled with, on the left-hand side, sauerkraut and on the right-hand side, um, mashed potatoes. And later on, these packages were retorted, so they were sterilized um, in order to to uh, kill all relevant bacteria and to increase the shelf life. And after that, they were stored 70 days at room temperature, a little bit above room temperature. Um, Left-hand side pictures contain EVOH plus an oxygen scavenger. The right-hand side pictures contain only the uh, EVOH barrier material. And you can see here, with the vegetables especially, a discoloration. This product is not bad. It still is within the shelf life. It is still good. You can still eat, eat it. But what would you like to eat more after my presentation at lunch? This one or that one? And the same is also possible with the, with the mashed potatoes. Now, we had the principle. We have seen with some real applications that it is working. But also, we, uh, of course, we can also scientifically measure what's happening. So we as Albus have uh, developed a device to measure the oxygen absorption of um, film samples, which basically is straightforward. It's, it's a glass vessel that can be closed airtight. On the bottom, we would fill some water in order to have enough humidity to activate the oxygen absorption. Then we put the sample inside here, and we have a sensor that constantly, meaning each minute, is measuring pressure, temperature, and humidity level inside the vessel. So, and with this device, we can um, get such a curve, where you can see on the y axis the oxygen absorption of this sample in cubic centimeter oxygen per gram of used oxygen scavenger versus the time. And the different curves, you, different curves you see are the different products available on the market. So the basic difference between the products is the carrier material used. Um, these days we can commercially offer EVA, PP, and PE, while polyamide is still a development grade, not yet 100% ready to market. Um, so what I've um, 
said before, oxygen scavenging, which time frame does it, does it take? As you can see, see here under these conditions, so 100% humidity and 21% oxygen concentration inside this vessel, we reach a plateau after eight days. So for eight days, we see a really huge oxygen uptake. And after those eight days, we reach the plateau. So the capacity is used. All of the iron that was inside the film has turned into iron oxide. And this also explains why we need to combine oxygen scavengers together with barrier materials. Because for these eight days, the material looks like a barrier. It would not let oxygen through because it catches all the oxygen and transforms it into iron oxide. But after those eight days, the capacity is full and it opens again. So it would be open to oxygen permeation again. So this is the reason why we always have to combine passive barrier with active barrier materials. And what also is rather obvious, this is ideal conditions. So high oxygen concentration in the testing device and high humidity levels. In real life, so in your final packaging or the customer's final packaging, of course the oxygen level can be lower, can be only 5%, and the humidity also a little bit less than, than um, the 100%. So this kinetic of the eight days will prolong. So we will have 14 days, maybe 20 days of activity of the material. Now what many people are not considering, me standing up here front saying humidity is important sounds easy, but if you have a real life application, sometimes it becomes not so easy anymore. So we have uh, shown here some, um, some graphs of the absorption capacity of such an active uh, oxygen scavenger at different humidity levels. And you see if you work with 60%, 50 or even only to 43% humidity, it would not activate you don't get the oxygen absorption. So this is for some applications a benefit, for some applications a disadvantage. For example, paprika powder, dry things. You will not be able to scavenge the oxygen out of such a paprika packaging. Um, so you really need to have products that carry enough humidity to work with iron-based oxygen scavengers. Talking again, a little bit about EVOH. EVOH is a great passive barrier material, but it has one big weakness. Um, if EVOH goes through retort, pasteurization, sterilization, these are processes where water is involved, and this EVOH will attract a lot of water, will expand, will swell, and therefore be open for a certain period of time for high values of oxygen transmission. This is documented here, so if you have um, an application with no oxygen scavenger, just EVOH, in the first days after production, your OTR, so oxygen transition rate, is rather high. And only after 28, 30 days, you reach those values of 0.05, which are the target for the application at the end of the day. Now, if you combine this together with an active oxygen scavenger, you completely avoid this effect. You remain at this low level of 0 0.05 um, OTR from the very beginning. So we can even say that um, if your target is not to reduce the amount of oxygen that was inside the packaging, but only to keep oxygen from coming in, this is the, a real safe way to do so if you are talking about EVH, EVOH. Now a little bit of a wrap up. What are the benefits and possibilities of oxygen scavenger? scavenging, of course, we can get a longer shelf life of foodstuff. We need less conservatives, less preservatives to be added to food to get such a shelf life. We preserve, we, we stabilize the color of food, but also the taste. Um, what does not, what is not required if you use um, active oxy oxygen scavengers in the, the film of your packaging, you don't need to use any, any sachets or any labels that do the absorption job. Um, limitation, of course, we can only work with products that carry humidity, but we can improve the barrier properties. And we can combine this technology or we can apply it in extrusion, we can apply it in injection molding, and we can combine it also with in-mold labeling. And it doesn't matter if in-mold labeling comes via thermoforming or if it comes via injection molding. 
So if everything is done properly, it's really a nice application. What is the driver to do that? Um, we see in, in Europe that we really have an increasing share of convenience food. People don't like to cook so much anymore. People want to have fast the food fast on the table if they, if they are at home. But on the same side, on, in the same moment, they want to have a really high quality. So they want to have a fresh perception. It, sh it should be fresh, it should be okay, it should be really good quality. Um, so in this concept, of course, it makes a lot of sense to, to um, increase the shelf life, to increase color, taste, freshness of products. And then we have the industry that is really seeking more and more opportunities to, to do more plastic applications, to replace tin, to replace glass. Um, one driver, for example, is that such a product, a tin can, is, can be found in the supermarket in some shelves. But what they want to do, they want to have a fresh perception. So they, with this product or this product, fridge pack, you can go into the refrigerated areas of the, of the supermarkets where the customer's perception is, this is fresh, this is uh, good quality, this is healthy for me. So this is a driver to go from, from cans to plastic applications. And then, of course, we have the bisphenol A uh, discussion for the coating of the tin cans. France has already a ban in place, so whenever you are importing tomato past paste, uh, for example, to France, uh, this can be a problem using, using the tin cans with the BPA coating. A little bit of an outlook, what can be done next? For us, a very promising um, project is back in box, so a pouch basically filled with a beverage, with a drink. This can be wine, this can be beer, this can be apple juice, can be also tomato juice. And then this pouch is put into a cardboard box and you can put in your fridge and tap glass by glass, portion by portion. And this setup of application is very sensitive to oxygen ingress. You have oxygen in the wine, in the headspace, it can come in through the welding lines, through the tap, so a lot of possible oxygen ingress. And there you really have a high opportunity if you apply an oxygen scavenger to make this application work better. Another thing, if you have these um, welded pouches, you can have in the weld line pinholes. Those pinholes carry oxygen that can arrive inside the, the packaging volume of the pouch. And in this application, a sausage roll this led to a significant discoloration. Now, if you add an oxygen scavenger to the packaging film, it's also here in the welding line, the pinholes are still there, but if the oxygen is inside the pinhole, it's absorbed, so it doesn't reach the inside anymore, and you don't have the discoloration. So, and that's it. And a little bit more possibilities that can be done. So, that was my presentation. Thank you very much for your patience. And now, are you hungry or not? <laughs>